This could be theory. I'm not a Bible scholar. You know that, right? I'm a pastor. Many shepherds don't even know the Bible. They just watch people. The scripture says if a man knows how to rule well, he should be counted worthy of double honor, especially those that labor in the word and in doctrine. See, that scripture tells me that it's possible that a man could rule well but not even labor in the word or labor in doctrine. So uh, I'm one such. While I read the word and study it and listen to God on your behalf and for my own self, I'm still not a Bible scholar. I don't know, I don't know the Greek and the Hebrew and, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know all the wonderful Bible secrets that are known to so many scholars that get together and discuss it. I just am not that. Um, so for that reason, I want to give you tonight, not, I'm not taking license on the scripture, but I think I have a pretty good theory about this subject. We were talking about it earlier tonight. I've been talking about it through the week. Um, and as we're getting ready to talk about this, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 1, and I'll share with you some things we've done today in the last couple of days. Greg Nations is finally on the mend, y'all. Thank God. Man, thank you, Jesus. He, uh, he moved after his, um, his leg was removed March 18th. That's my birthday. So he and I will always be connected. It's amazing. And uh, then he began to have uh, unusual side effects to the surgery. To have a limb removed, you've got to go through. It's a trauma. It's like a terrible car wreck. And um, so his body reacted adversely to the removal of that leg, and swelling took place in places that just were unheard of. The doctor didn't know, it would, it would, was not expecting. Um, and so they uh, dealt with him medically as much as you would expect. And he, being at Emory, he's in one of the finest hospitals in the world. But finally... He had a terrible blood clot that was causing a lot of pain and because it was not near an artery, it, it would take longer time to, for that to dissolve. And, uh, as it was dissolving, they finally did move him out of the hospital room into rehab where it's still doctor-assisted rehab. The people are on the floor all the time. It's just like a hospital. And, of course, being on morphine and you know, your mind's not all there, and he was reported as t ask, telling Tanya, he said, I've been telling the doctors I want to see my feet, but they won't let me see my feet. And then he had to realize that he didn't have any feet. And uh, so he had to mourn the loss of a limb. It's, it's just like losing a child or losing a family member. Or, I mean, it's something you've had all your life, and now you don't have it. And so it's been hard on him emotionally, mentally, uh, he, physically. Just It's just been hard. And uh, so we go see him. And then when, when the, the KCM team was here, Riley Stevenson and I went over to see him at, at, while he was still in the hospital. And he just was out of it. He shook Riley's hand and he said hello to me. But he just he wanted to just exit. He didn't want to be there. Almost, if he could be in a fetal position, he'd have been in it. And uh, he... Uh, uh, but in time, he, about two, last week sometime, early last week, he asked for his guitar, and Tanya brought it to him, but he sat there, he didn't want to play it. So um, this week on, uh, what was it, Monday? What is today? Wednesday? I can't remember what day it was now. Monday. What day was it we went over there? Okay, it was Monday. We went to play. I brought the, my guitar, and my nephew Shannon was there for a regular checkup at Emory, so I told him where I was going. He was in town for his uh, blood work. And so uh, I said, I'm going to bring my guitar, and I want you to come up there with me. And so he did. He jumped right in. He's waiting at the, at the uh, um, rehab for me when I got there. So we went in, and uh, 
I introduced him to Shannon, and Shannon's much more accomplished as a musician and a singer than I am. And and uh, so he and Greg met, and he after he strummed a few things, and I just handed Greg his guitar. He said, "Play it, brother." I said, "Now play it." Greg, I put it in his lap, and he started picking around. Of course, he hadn't played in nearly a year, and so his fingers got sore real quick, and he couldn't find chords, and he's still about out of it, and he's playing around a little bit, and in a little bit, I started seeing life come back. And then in time, nurses would come by, they'd walk in at the edge of his room and look and listen. And a couple of nurses came, they stood there and they were standing at the room like this, watching. And uh, they were smiling, of course they would sing songs that they all knew. And one lady came up and she said, that's my song right there, I remember that from the 70s, baby. And she was dancing and while he's playing, and. And then uh, one nurse came in and she just started weeping and sobbing. She said, I can't let him see me cry. She said, I can't see him, let him see me cry. She said, it's just so good to see him. Because see him. he's playing and singing. So they had not seen him. He just laid there despondent long before they went to rehab. And so for them, it was like a resurrection. Well, it brought him back. And so he asked us to come back again. So next thing we knew is the, the floor nurse, the, the, the resident floor uh, attending physician, called for a concert for uh, today at 2.30. So uh, they printed flyers, Greg Nation's in concert, right at the nurse's station on, on, on the fourth floor. So they spread it all through the rehab all there over Emory, and we probably had 25 doctors and nurses there this, this morning. That, and so I took my guitar, Shannon brought his, and Greg, they, we wheeled Greg out, and he's picking and playing, and Shannon would sing with him and play with him. I'd try to follow and keep up, and so and then I'd sing with him. And, and uh, uh, of course, Greg came out with some songs that I didn't even know he'd ever written. Um, he wrote, he'd written a song. I've got to get him, when he gets back here, he's got to play this song for you about how he got mad at, at somebody. <laughs> what was the name of it? Somebody, he was mad at some woman. No, that was the other one. He picked, he picked out this funny song about being mad and about something about the dog about being mad at her and it was just it was hilarious and of course everybody just busted out laughing and uh, then there were some nurses I could see them teary eyed and even though they were laughing and we had a good time we played about a half a dozen songs and and uh, so um, it has been a good day and he was better today than he was Monday and then he uh, then he gave his guitar to my nephew today and it's a nice one it's a nice acoustic and he, and uh, uh, I took two cowboy hats and I left one with him. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know what he said to Shannon? Shannon told him, he said, man, I can't take your guitar. He said, it's not like I could run you down and take it back. <laughs> <laughs> he is so funny. They're going to get him up on some prosthetic legs here in the next few months. And uh, they're going to fit him out when swelling goes down. They, they'll outfit him and get him ready. And they'll put him up on stubbies to start with, short ones, so he learns balance. And he was telling me funny things like, he said, uh, I'm going to be three foot six inches tall. When I walk in, you just pat me on the head. And he said, next time you see me, I'm going to be saying, that plane, that plane. <laughs> Herbie Velikai saying, what was the name of that show? The, was it The Love Boat? or no. What was it? Fantasy, Fantasy, Fantasy Island, that's it. And uh, <laughs> so his sense of humor is still there. And, uh, uh, anyway. You know this pastoring thing is not just a job of mine. And it's my job, I understand that. But I, don't, I never have known how to not be all involved in your life. I don't know how to not do that. I don't know how to, I don't know how to, and I'm like anybody, any pastor I guess is like this, but God's attitude is, if you draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. If you're at a distance, I'll leave you at a distance. I don't bother you if you need to be distant. And so Greg, got close up on me and got close and I got close to him and um, and you know the natural side and I should not do this because it is always it never meets with a good result or it hasn't often sometimes it does but when you've when I've lost when we've lost two brothers or both brothers have gone to heaven just in the last couple of years few years having an older man that had the same interests that I and my brothers have is very comforting to me. So there's a natural side of that. I like the fact that you guys, uh, those of you that like to play the guitar, I like that about you guys. I, 
those of you that that um, that know music, I like that. If, if you if you um, take on my interests, if you like baseball, I like that. If you, if you like to um, work on old vintage vehicles, I'm totally into that. And and um, so I've enjoyed him for those reasons. But it has been good. It has been <laughs> my heart has been bubbling, ready to cry for the last week just by seeing him tr try to come on the mend and moving in the right direction. And he told me this morning something I didn't realize. He said, you know, he said, I didn't know food tasted so bad. He said, I, I, he said I'm beginning to taste food again, and I want to eat now. He said, but before, he said, everything I, I'd eat, I'd taste that old MRSA, that infection. And, and uh, God. So. The report is, while he's still in the woods and got a long way to go, he's coming out and coming in the right direction. So every little bit every day is, is, a, is a major wonderful thing. Um, having said that, let's go to Acts chapter 1 and take a look at something I want to share with you. You've heard me say some of these things before, but it bears repeating. Acts chapter 1. Tonight, thank you, sir, for this written word. Give me wisdom to deliver it. I believe this is ready for the pulpit, in Jesus' name. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of that all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, until the day in which he was taken up. After that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom, or to whom, to the, the apostles, also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, it says here that at the end of verse 8, verse 9, it says, When he'd spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said to them, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, I want you to get a vision. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to get this vision, please. Jesus didn't go up like a ghost. He wasn't like a vapor that carried up like smoke. He was standing there in his physical body. Here, handle me. A spirit hath not flesh and bone like you see me have. See, we're both real. Jesus was real. That's what he said to, to, Phil, to, to Thomas. He said, handle me, touch me. I'm not a ghost. Now, when he was taken up, he went out the Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem. He'd spoken commandments to the apostles whom he'd chosen. And he had been seen of them for 40 days. And it says, while he was taken up, he physically, his feet left the ground. And they watched him go up. They watched him physically go up into the air. Like weightless. And they watched him Get up higher. And I know what Jesus looked down at him. I know how he did. Being ascended. And it says a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they stood gazing steadfastly toward heaven, they're watching. Nobody saw him when they showed up, but two men in white apparel stood there. These are two angels. You men of Galilee, why are you standing, staring so steadfastly into heaven? Well, I could have answered that. I would have said, 
Well, it's not every day you see somebody float in the air. We thought we'd watch this for as long as we could. Besides, this was Jesus. What, where have you been? <laughs> now, that would seem like a dumb question to me. But the point they were making is, this same Jesus whom you were watching go into heaven physically shall so come in like manner. Now, how is Jesus going to return? He's going to come out of a cloud physically. He's going to show up. They'll see him coming down. He'll come all the way down and he'll put his feet on the Mount of Olives. Physically. Now, he's not, he, he's not going to need a parachute. and He's not going to be coming fast. He'll show up fast, but he'll just come down just in the same way he was taken up and boom, his feet touch the ground. He'll be, he'll be back. Now, much has been said over the years about the, the return of the Lord. They've been looking for him from the day that he went that day into heaven and the cloud received him out of the sight. Now, was this a physical cloud? I want you to look at the, what, who, what was the cloud that, that took him out of, out of sight. This is, this is, again, this is perhaps Pastor John theoretically, but uh, let's take a look. Hebrews chapter 12. Hmm? Hebrews. Yeah, we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15 here in just a minute. And um, Hebrews chapter 12. All of Hebrews 11 speaks of those that walked by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And then he starts talking about how that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Verse 5, by, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. And um, then by faith, verse 7, Noah. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham. Verse 11 says, by faith, Sarah, Abraham's wife. It says, all these all died in faith. And then, verse 17, once again, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered Isaac. And verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph. Verse 23, by faith, Moses. Verse 24, by faith, Moses again. How do you, See, faith is not something just of the new, new covenant. These were men had faith in the old covenant. It says, by faith, he forsook Egypt, in verse 27. Through faith, he kept the Passover, verse 28. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Verse 31, By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with them that didn't believe, because she received the spies with peace. Then he says in verse 32, What shall I more say? For the time would fail me. I don't even have enough time to tell, to take, to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead children raised to life again. By faith this was done. The Bible says in verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us so that they without us should not be made perfect. They were the first generation Christian. We're the final generation Christian. We're the ones that snapped the tape with the baton in our hand. They have a perfection they're waiting on for us to finish to hand to them. Now, Verse 12 says, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What is the cloud of witnesses? All these people that he spoke of that lived by faith in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. This is the cloud that Jesus was taken up into out of sight. It wasn't a physical white cloud. It looked like a cloud because it's so full of people dressed in the righteousness of the saints. 
the white righteousness of saints. This, these people were the ones that, when Jesus raised from the dead in the 27th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, the 52nd, 53rd verse, it said that many bodies of the saints which slept arose and were seen of many. I think I'll sit down and talk to you. Now, Jesus was not the only one that raised from the dead that morning. Have you heard it said that Jesus is our example? You heard that said? Did we followed Him in His earth walk. We follow Him to the cross. We follow Him into His judgment. We follow Him in His resurrection. We follow Him in His ascension. We will follow Him in the eternal kingdom. See, if we're going to follow Him in all those things, then why would it not be, would it be a reach to say that we will do the same thing He did? If He was seen of many and then stayed around 40 days, what happened to those guys that were resurrected that morning that he was resurrected? They went into the city and were seen of many. Well, you don't think they went to heaven before Jesus did, do you? No. They went up to receive him in a cloud. He, they, they ascended with him. The cloud of people went up at the same time with him. Everybody's eyes were focused on Jesus, but he went up into the cloud with everybody. They were here the same 40 days he was after they resurrected. That brings me to my point. He's coming again. He's coming back. He said he was. And everything he said up until now has come to pass. I doubt seriously, I will guarantee you seriously, that this next thing that he said he's going to do is going to happen too. Now, let's then take that in mind and go to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says right here, verse 51, Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we're not all going to die but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Underline that, please, in your Bible. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality because corruptibility and immortality or mortality, corruptibility and mortality, is a result of the fall of Adam. And so that has to be shed to everything that came to the human race as a result of this union between Adam and Satan in the garden. All of that has to be eradicated. All that has to be made obsolete. That's why this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is your victory? See, every grave appears to have a victory over every human being that you've ever known that are in their graves. It appears that the grave has its final say. It's been said that nobody can beat the grim reaper. No. The day will come when we'll say, then the, the, the saying will come to pass, and we'll say, Grave, where's your victory now? He says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know 
that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, to close this up tonight, let me just share this with you. It says, verse 52, once again, in it we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. All right, now let me just offer you a theory. <laughs> Much has been said about the silent rapture, where suddenly planes will be crashing, cars will be wrecking, people will be taken out of there. Right, walking down the street, suddenly they're taken up. People at work be taken up, folks sitting in class be just gone. One day they just vanish. Uh, you know, well, it's like the guy that said, uh, I hope the rapture don't take place in the pilot's a Christian. You know, you know, somebody said, uh, the, what was it? The guy said one time, he, the, the story that I heard is that he was sweating it on, he's sweating BBs on the airplane. He said, I just never like to fly. I hate it. He said, the guy said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, if, 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 you're, if it comes your time to go, you're going to go. You can't worry about that. He said, I'm not worried about it. if it's my time to go. I just wonder if it's your time to go. See, see, I want you to see it like this. It's, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. We have been, we've had it taught to us that God's going to sneak up on everybody. And suddenly he's just going to, I'm here. Up, everybody's gone. Up, you didn't get right, so you're going to get left. You know, and... That's not the way he's doing it at all. Because if it was as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of Son of Man. Then let's, that gives us a little bit of insight. What was it like in the days of Noah? The rain beginning to descend in Noah's day is a type of Christ coming in this day. Noah received a seven-day advance notice, one week. God told him, yet seven days and I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. So does it stand to reason then that we will also get a seven day advance notice? I realize it's theory. What I'm saying is that we won't be snuck up on, nor will the world. It says that we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. What does that tell me about the trumps? There's more than one. There's at least two. Because it's plural. I can find in scriptures where there are a hundred trumpets. I don't know how many trumpets will trump and sound prior to the Lord's return. But I want to offer you this theory. What if it's one trumpet per day for seven days? I don't know. I just know this. When that first trumpet sounds heralding the coming of the king anytime a king came even today when the president comes in they start playing hail to the chief don't they before the king is presented in any court the trumpeteers trumpet the coming of the king the first trumpet will sound we'll all hear it the whole earth will hear, hear it what do you think will happen next Folks go to questioning, what was that? That sounded a lot like a trumpet. People start calling. People start calling each other. What, did you hear that? They're talking at work. Did you hear that? I've seen people leave their, their office cubicle to go outside and watch a, a solar eclipse, for God's sake. I've seen them do that. What, what's going to happen to the sound of the trump? People are going to start talking. What was that? Who blew that? That was a trumpet. There's no doubt in my mind. It's the sound of a trumpet. People, then they're going to start talking. And then it'll hit, the, it'll hit the, the news. There was a sound of a loud trumpet today. Here's the buzz. It's going on all over. People are going to start calling. People are going to start requesting information from preachers. Was, this, was that a trump or was that just a sound? And then they'll, a lot of naturalizing of it will take place. And about the time everybody calms down and gets quiet, they're still talking about it a little bit. There's a few 
things being said on Twitter and people are putting things on Facebook. And about the time everything gets quiet, another trumpet will sound with a little more intensity than the first one. Now everybody's talking. Some people are repenting. Other people are calling. They start calling their kin folks. Start, everybody starts calling everybody. This is it. I'm sure this is it. I, everybody starts calling folks and they're, it's the buzzword all over. And the buzz doesn't go away this time before another trumpet sounds. And when this trumpet sounds, now you got people crying. Folks that are going to great lengths. People are, you're going to see wholesale repentance at every trump subsequent to the first one. One time after another, after another. After, whole nations will come to God at the sound of those trumps. Because now we're at a time where at just the click of a button, you can see and hear and, and communicate with people worldwide instantaneously. What is going to happen? But with each trump, the Bible says the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. The dead are not raised incorruptible until the last trump. So the last trump, with every trump, if the dead is not raised, there People are going to be calling. John Hagee will be on, on television 24 hours a day. He'll be being talked to. Uh, other Bible scholars will be on. Joel Osteen, people are going to want to know what Joel has to say about it. I mean, my, Billy Graham, I'm sure he'll still be here. He's not. <laughs> I'm just saying that there are, there's going to be ministers and people. Spiritualists will come out of the, the woodwork. And the only thing that's going to stand is that's going to even make any sense is what the Bible has to say. But the final trump that will take place is the one you know it's the last trump because that's when the resurrection takes place. The final trump is the one that trumpets the coming of the Lord and then the dead are raised in corruptible. And you know what? Take for just a minute and think how many people have died since Adam. How many? All except the seven, what, how many, seven billion on the earth right now? Well, where'd their bodies go? Anybody know? They all got buried. The sea is full of the bones of dead men. Of the righteous dead. It would not surprise me on that final trump that people are going to resurrect right through the middle of your living room floor because <laughs> that's where they were buried 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. What I'm telling you is that there's going to be a lot of people resurrect at that final trump in places. Here in America, most everybody that died in the past 100 years are all Christians. See, Jesus will come back and there, there, his scripture says 10,000 of his saints will come with him. They will physically come back, rejoin their physical body and their physical body is resurrected because that body has to resurrect in the earth because that death is a constant reminder of the union of Adam and Satan and that cannot be tolerated. Then once they're raised from the dead, how long do they stay? Do they just come out of the grave and go straight to heaven? Anybody know? I think the dead will be here 40 days just like Jesus was. And I think when I think they'll go back and testify to everybody and everybody will get a chance to repent and come to the Lord. And still there will be people that will not repent. Well, what happens then? At the end of the 40 days, the dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the, what clouds? What clouds? The clouds of the people, the clouds of the great witnesses to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, then what happens to the ones that didn't repent that are here in the earth? There's your tribulation period. And during the tribulation, there are people that will get saved. Yes. Because if, if good times won't, if you don't walk in repentance in good times, bad times are coming that will force repentance. Okay. I say these things to you periodically and I'm subject to revision 
But I'm telling you this, y'all. This is close. This is very, very close. Closer than it was yesterday. But it's close. It's so close now. Do you realize this is 2015? It would not surprise me if this generation, you and me, are the ones that will see all this. I know everybody has said that in recent years, but, you know, when, when you've got a God that you're dealing with, a day and a thousand years are all one and the same, a thousand years and a day is the same, it's very, very close to him. But it's got to a place now where it's just as close for us as it is for him. I think this is why you're seeing, the reason why there's so much unrest in the Middle East is because Christianity is just absolutely taking it by storm. Iran has more Christians and more churches growing there than anywhere else in the earth. This is why there's so much upset. That's why things are turning over like they are. Listen, don't you get it, don't you make any mistake about it. They're going to put a lot of, of uh, press on a few people losing their heads. But where everyone that loses their heads, there's another five or 10,000 that are being born again out of the is Islamic world. People are turning to Jesus by the droves. They're seeing that their, their religion is bankrupt and they're coming to the real God. Any questions about what we talked about tonight? Can you imagine what a resurrected person is going to look like? You'll recognize him. Young. They'll be recognizable. You'll see them. You'll see their personality hadn't changed. Still the same person. They're all going to need a place to sleep. They're going to need a place to stay. I know folks then are going to be taking their six weeks vacation all at one time. Because that's about 40 days, isn't it? Well, let's go ahead and take off and spend time with kinfolk. Don't you know the people that have resurrected that have been in heaven all these years and their spiritual body come back and join their physical body? Don't you know there's a lot that they can reveal to you, the questions that you've always asked, and you'll have all that time to learn all these things, and you'll be mesmerized and can't wait to go? Oh, yeah. Very close. Until then, however, the Scripture says, Occupy until he comes. Occupy. Stay busy with what you're called to do here in the earth. Till then, I'm going to shepherd sheep. I'm going to watch people and pray for the sick. Lead people to the Lord. Teach the Bible. With all of my shortcomings and faults and everything that all my own personal weaknesses that blare in my face daily, I've just um, those things used to bother me worse than they do now. I just they're there and I'm better in some areas than I'm than I used to be and I'm worse in some areas than I used to be. But the fact is the mercy of the Lord and the grace of God is what I rest on. And this is why I can have patience. I got patience with myself. And if I have as much patience with myself as I have with you, I'll be good. Because I have patience with people. This is all part of the earth is the place where you have patience. But be it known unto you tonight that the Lord Jesus is soon to return for his saints, with his saints with him. And he will establish a, a kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness, and he'll turn the kingdom up to God. He must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. The final enemy that is put under is death. This death thing will be dealt with. It's already been dealt with in the spirit. It will be dealt with in the flesh. Look forward to it with great anticipation. Look forward. We have a wonderful life now. We have a better life coming. Amen. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we just look, we look forward to that day that you've promised us.
Till then, I'm going to thoroughly enjoy this life. I woke up here in the earth. Otherwise, you'd have had me elsewhere. This is where you want me. This is where you want us to be. We're going to enjoy this life. We're going to talk to people about Jesus. Talk to them about the things of God. We're going to, oh, we're going to enjoy our life. You said you'd give us freely all things to enjoy. So the things that we have, that we'll have to enjoy, we will have them and enjoy them while we're in the earth. But the day comes when we look for another kingdom, another country, that is a heavenly, wherein dwells righteousness, where friends and neighbors and kinfolk and relatives and folks that we have loved in days past are there, where people that we know today are there, and when things will be pleasing to you and you'll no longer have to be patient as you were in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. The ark of the covenant of the Lord is being prepared now and we're soon to be taken out. Until then, we're right here, right in the center of the will of God, in Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all. Sickness is part of the curse. He wants to completely remove Death is part of the curse. Never the will of God for you to attend a funeral. Ever.